Well, welcome back, everybody. It is uh, Networking 101 Day. So uh, we'll just do a couple. Uh, a lot of people are still uh, just coming in. So uh, we'll you know, run these. Uh, you know, I think we got four or five polls. Nothing, nothing you know, too difficult. And then we'll uh, pass this off to Jonathan and Nate to uh, talk about Networking 101. And then, uh, you know, next week we have, you know, the last part of the IQ Wi-Fi 6 series. We'll, we'll be, you know, doing talking a lot about the Alarm.com integration. Uh, Joel is going to drop in the chat shortly, if he hasn't already, uh, the link for the next season, which will actually focus. It'll be about a two-week break from uh, next. So next Thursday, about a two-week break. We'll be starting uh, the next series, which will be IQ4 Hub. And then we'll, uh, after that, we'll do IQ Pro. So I'm just going to launch these polls quickly. And... Uh, so I can get off camera and then let Nate and Jonathan go. So uh, there we go, nice and easy. So compared to a year ago, are you installing more or less Wi-Fi devices in customers' locations? Is it more or less about the same? Wow. Okay, that's uh, that's great. So roughly three quarters are installing more. Uh, I'm not surprised. You know, Wi-Fi is definitely becoming more prevalent. And also at the same time can be a little more difficult uh, from a troubleshooting standpoint. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, what, you, what you're learning during the IQ Wi-Fi 6 series should be pretty helpful. So lots of people have voted. I'll close that one off. And all right, this is an easy one. It's true or false. You feel like you and, and or your technicians need to have a better understanding of networking. It's a true or false. It's not too tough. There we go. 100% true. 100% true. Well, somebody, somebody is must be a networking guru because you know we got one person who says false. So that's great. Um, you know, we'll just go. Oh, lots, lots of votes dropping in. <clears throat> uh -huh. All right, we'll close that one off. Nice and quick. So, on average, how many Wi-Fi devices do you sell or install on a typical install? Pretty easy. A lot of one to fours, a lot of more than eights. Wow, that's great. Uh, so, yeah, so the, I'd say a good strong 90% are installing more than, uh, you know, somewhere between one and six devices, 90% of you. That's crazy. Only 1%, one person so far has said they are not installing Wi Fi devices. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, we'll close that one up. Two more quick ones. Would you consider consider you or your team to be afraid of networking? Pretty comfortable or very comfortable? Okay, well, we got a couple afraid of networking, but the majority, high majority, 60 plus percent, pretty comfortable with networking. That's awesome. That is awesome. Uh, almost almost uh, just over 80% are between pretty comfortable and very comfortable. And we got about just about 20% we're kind of afraid of network guy. I really think what you're going to see today may uh, may help you with that. So we're going to close that one more second. Close it. One more. So what if any? Let's try this again. Launch. What if any would be the biggest hesitation from installing a Wi-Fi network? So you can choose all that apply. You know, cost, lack of personal knowledge, lack of technical knowledge. You know, you know, uh, bad prior experiences. And if you have something that's other, drop it in chat, and we uh, we'd love to hear that. But uh, yeah, a lot of costs, you know, forty percent cost, yeah, a lot of lack of technical or networking knowledge, and a lot of bad prior experiences with Wi-Fi network. So we're looking at, you know, a good forty percent of people, Nate, are and Jonathan are having a bad prior experience. Forty percent and fifty percent with a lack of technical or networking knowledge, and sixty percent with cost. So wow. I'm not completely surprised, actually, with those results, but very interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll close that one off. I'm going to shut my camera off, and we're going to let Nate and uh, Jonathan, uh, you know, take off here. And uh, you know, I'll be in. I'll be hanging out and chat with Joel. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, well, Neil. thank you, Neil. I uh, figured I'd just kind of start out and uh, introduce myself, and then I'll let uh, Jonathan do the same. Um, you know, I'm back for the second week in a row. Um, ho hopefully, we're getting a lot of repeat um, uh, folks in uh, on these webinars. Um, we're excited to actually be here. Um, I guess a little bit about me. I come from the CDS space. Um, I've been with JCI now for about three years. Um, yeah, so I'm, again, happy to be here. 
Uh, Jonathan, you want to uh, introduce yourself? Sure. I'm a technical account manager for the Southeast, so I cover Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and I've been teaching this class at a lot of the shows around the Southeast this year, so when they reached out to me and said, hey, what class do you want to teach? I was like, dude, I'd love to take Networking 101, because a lot of us think we know it, but unfortunately, there's a lot of things that we just sometimes forget about. Yeah, so we'll uh, just kind of dive right in here. Um, so we thought we'd just start off by um, going over some commonly used terms um, and just explain, you know, what they mean. So um, with uh, most everything in networking uh, related, really has to do with uh, these acronyms and uh, you know what they what they mean and and as they relate to networking. So, um, Jonathan, uh, do you want to take us through this list here real quick? Sure. And I've, only, I've taught this class about seven times and I've only had one person get MAC correct, which stands for Media Access Control. It was one of those ones that was a little on the tricky side, but it really showed people that, you know, a lot of these terms we know like LAN, like everybody knows that's a local area network. It's a really easy one. ISP is whoever your internet service provider is. DHCP, um, the easiest way to sum that up is when you come home, your cell phone automatically connects to your network through DHCP. WAP stands for wireless access point and has nothing to do with that song. So just kind of be aware of that one. I have, have to be a little careful on that one and, and doing in-person classes. I'm really afraid somebody's gonna blurt that one out. SSID, uh, service set identifier. We're gonna be talking about that as we move forward. One that everybody wants is megabits per second. You know, we all want that super fast connection speed. I wanna be able to download that video. I wanna be able to upload that image that, or that picture that we took of the package being at the front door. So we definitely want that really strong connection. To make connecting devices so super easy is gonna be WPS Wi-Fi protected setup. We're gonna be talking about that. And you can set up IP Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi 6 using WPS. So Nate's gonna get into that a little bit later. And something else that Nate's also gonna be talking about is RSSI, Received Signal Strength Indicator. This is a huge one because a, a lot of the questions are, well, where should I put this thing, right? Where should I drop this node at? And we're gonna be talking about that and being able to use some tools to make your network be much stronger than what we it currently is today. Yeah, so uh, moving right along here, um, we thought we'd talk uh, just a little bit about um, IP addresses, you know, what, what they all mean. Um, you know, essentially when I look at an IP address, I've got, um, four um, different sets of numbers, right? Um, you've got, uh, we call those octets. Uh, what octet are we looking at? Um, typical uh, public IP address uh, might look like something similar to the, the number that you see here on the in the cloud outside IP address, you know, like a 71.15.30.62. Um, when you see a crazy number like that, chances are it is a, a public IP address. Um, and then an internal IP address would look something more along the lines of a 192.168 number. Um, there are some 10 dot numbers out there, um, some other uh, um, gateways, um, you know, uh, some network uh, Netgear uh, devices might, might have those. Um, but yeah, a uh, residential uh, IP address would, would, would look something similar to this. Um, so for today's presentation, we're going to focus in on uh, IQ Wi-Fi, IQ Wi-Fi 6, um, you know, and this is what our uh, gateway address is. So 192.168.105.1. And, you know, here's just a quick example of some of the um, internal IP addresses that, that it may um, dynamically address um, devices that are connected to it. Um, and, and why is it important, uh, Jonathan, to understand the difference between you know, these subnets or um, octets uh, as, as we talk about working 101. All right, so <laughs> you definitely alluded to it, is that as we bring devices into the home and take away devices, the router has to be able to assign IP addresses and it can also release and renew those IP addresses when it feels like it. So if you've ever been using, let's say the ISP's router before, now, Again, this is probably not a piece of equipment that's at the highest standard because it's more of a traditional cost standpoint because it's usually given 
or they charge very little per month to have it. So it's probably not the best piece of equipment out there on the market. So it dictates how network traffic and literally how it handles these IP addresses. Because as we take our phones and computers and, and we leave the home, then those IP addresses are freed up. But when we show back up, most of the time they're, they're given back out the same IP addresses. But as we know, there's more and more things are going on the network around the house, whether it's your Sonos speakers, I got a new Wi-Fi printer, um, we're seeing appliances now that are definitely going on the network. Like, unfortunately, I had to buy a new refrigerator this year, and it's now on the network. So it has to have its own unique IP address. And those IP addresses allow them to talk not only to themselves, but also back to the main router. So if we have something that we're not talking to, it might be on the wrong IP address. Now, unfortunately, I have been on a job site with an IT specialist and I was like, hey buddy, I don't think my IP communicator is on the same network. And he's like, oh no, no, you don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, oh, okay. So he sat there and troubleshooted for an hour and he's like, hey, wait a second, your IP address is not on the same subnet mask as, as the other devices. I'm like, oh yeah, I kind of figured that out when I saw your IP address and I saw mine and my device and knew they weren't gonna talk to each other. So that's why it's so important that we're able to have them on the same one. So and all this network, it's all 192.168.105.something. Dot one is going to be the router, and then the numbers after that are going to be whatever device we have on the network, whether it's going to be the Sono speakers, maybe it's going to be our smart TV, because we're starting to see those so much more around the house. It's your computer, maybe it's your laptop, all these type devices. Yeah, just, just to add to what Jonathan's saying, I mean, if, if we had... Um, you know, it, I, I guess for uh, a, a little more clarification, right? If we if we wanted to print something from uh, a laptop that had the IP address 192.168.105.8 to a printer that had an IP address of 192.168.105.10, um, I should be able to, to to make that happen because um, because we know that those first three octets are the same, right? So. When we talk about subnets or octets, that's that's really what we're um, focusing in in here. If we had, um, you know, say the uh, configuration that Jonathan kind of alluded to, where maybe uh, the ISP has its own router, and then we put one of our networks in, and if the uh, printer was still connected to that ISP router, um, you know, we'd clearly see that just by looking at the IP address. Um, those first three octets would look something something different. So would you um, be able to print to that printer, Nate? If it was on a different subnet mask? No, no, you would not. You'd you'd, you'd have all sorts of uh, issues with that. So, you know, we we use that just as an example. Um, but yeah, something to to definitely be um, familiar with. So, as we move along here, um, you know, here's a quick uh, way to validate, you know, on your laptop, um, you know, what what address or what 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 subnet mask. Uh, you know it's getting so what are we looking at here Jonathan all right so this is literally taken off my computer my work computer so I went to the C prompt and I literally just typed in IP config you hit enter key and it will bring you back all this information so here you can see the IP address of my computer is 192.168.105.167 and I'm on that default gateway going back to Wi-Fi 6 is 192.168.105.1 is how my device is communicating. And it's funny that you did bring up the printer because my printer is actually on a parallel network. And every now and then I do try to print something off my work computer when I'm connected to Wi-Fi 6. And I'm like, man, why is this thing not printing? Like, what's wrong with my printer? And then I realized, hey, I'm, I'm on the wrong network. So when you brought that up, that's why I kind of had to chuckle here in the background because I've, I've made that mistake. Yeah, and it's a it's definitely a common one. So something to look out for, um, especially if you're utilizing you know this router in a parallel configuration. So um, you know as we're moving along, one of the things is we decided to bring uh, IQ Wi-Fi uh, and you know Gen 2 IQ Wi-Fi 6 to the market is we wanted to bring something to the market that was super simple, easy to configure, easy to um, uh, you know, support. Um, we spent a little bit of time last week explaining how to get that up and running. Um, really, I, I, I'd like to suggest that, you know, if, if, if you're going to um, have any trouble with uh, the solution, uh, one of the, uh, I, I guess, things to point out here as we look at 
um, you know, networking 101 as it relates to IQ Wi-Fi is agent placement. So we wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about agent placement. You know, what are some some quick uh, tips and uh, tricks, you know, to get uh, these configured properly? Well, there's several different ways that we can do this. First of all, just place them and hope for the best, right? You know, you got to start somewhere and there's nothing wrong with that. So as we place agents around the house, we can start building that, that network out. Now, there are some tools that you can use. And Dave, luckily, last week did discuss some of them. So there's Wi-Fi Analyzer for Android devices. Um, there is one for the iPhone. And unfortunately, my brain is just not working. I just cannot remember off the top of my head. Um, there's actually another way that you can actually see how good your network's working. And is if you have teenagers, I noticed that when my daughter was a teenager and she would have these softball tournaments and stuff, we would have a bunch of the girls over at the house, you know, after the game and stuff. And I noticed that they had a certain pattern that they would actually walk around the house with. And it was based on the Wi-Fi signal strength on their phone. And to me, I started analyzing this, going, looking at going, hey, wait a second. Like they don't go in dead spots. So if you don't have a teenager to walk around with, you're probably going to need to use a, a different tool to be able to make this happen. And Nate, didn't we have some tools of our own that we're going to be able to show? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I, I just point out before we move on to the next slide, um, you know, really uh, we're talking about SNR value or signal to noise ratio here, right? So signal to noise ratio is measured uh, zero to 100%. Um, if we look at at, at, at DBM, um, you know, we spent a little bit of time earlier talking about what that means. Um, but yeah, if we're if we're looking at a dB uh, level uh, signal strength, really we want it to be as close to that negative 50 dBs or greater. Um, anything less than that is going to fall into the good or poor, um, you know, categories. So a, a good example of, of what that might look like, you know, wirelessly is that little image on on the right there. And as we're placing these agents throughout the house, um, we do have some tools built in um, to help you um, understand exactly how these devices are communicating. So the quick uh, you know, reference would be the LEDs on the front of the IQ Wi-Fi 6. Um, you've got a, a little indicator there. Um, the, the WAN LED on, on these agents is gonna do one of uh, four things. Um, the first thing it'll do is as, as you place these agents around and they get paired up, you know, with the controller, um, if they're solid green, you know that it's connected and it's communicating and it's super happy. Um, if you see it start to blink, um, you're going to really want to pay attention to, um, you know, what type of blink it's actually doing. So if it's just a single blink, um, you're probably okay. You're, you're, you're probably right there um, in that good um uh, spot right it's 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 at least uh, communicating and it's probably okay to leave it um, if you've got that double blink um, you know we we probably ought to try to get that agent a little bit closer um, it's it's connected but it's really not an ideal location for for the agent um, and if it doesn't come on at all you know that it's completely outside of the range of connecting to that mesh network there is one other thing that I wanted to highlight here as we're talking about agent placement and it's um, currently found in the uh, web UI. So, you know, if you have a, a project where you've gone in and you've tried to um, get these agents um, connected and, and they're just not pairing for whatever reason, or, or maybe they are paired, um, but you wanted to move them a little bit, uh, you know, around the, uh, the, the property. First of all, if, if they're not pairing, you know, and you call them to tech support, tech support is going to tell you to move those agents, you know, within the same room. Um, as that controller, you know, just to get them paired. Then once they've been paired and they're um, updated and configured, you then can go and, and place them out into the, um, you know, in, in, into the environment that they um, are eventually going to reside in. Um, you can actually log into the web UI and, and see how they're communicating. So um, I'm, I'm going to try to connect to my uh, system here. Um, hopefully you guys can see this, right? So I've uh, uh, I'll quickly show you how to access this page. Um, I'm going to open up a web UI. I'm going to type in the IP address uh, 192.168.105.1. I'm going to hit enter and it's going to prompt me to log in. I'm going to enter in a username. The default username is admin. 
Um, my default uh, password is the password printed on the bottom of the controller. Um, and then uh, it's going to send me to this um, home screen. Um, here I have a quick overview of uh, kind of what's going on. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about everything on this page, but if I scroll down, I'll have a section here labeled agents. And um, during the installation of this uh, system, this is actually here uh, in the office, um, I went and labeled you know, where these agents are located. So I've got a, a, a couple different agents here. Um, I can see the DB level uh, signal strength. I can see that they're all communicating uh, via the five uh, gigahertz uh, band. Um, you know, this is good information. Really uh, what you ought to be looking at is this um, transmit and receive um, signal uh, rate is what this is. So um, anything that's above this 300 uh, megabyte, um, you know, we're, we're saying is, is, is pretty good, right? So anything less than that, if you've got like 100 megabytes here, um, that is not an ideal location. It's, it's utilizing essentially 10% of uh, what the capability of that um, router can do, right? So we just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, so right out of the gate, as we get ready to release this, um, this is some additional information, you know, as you're, as you're deploying these units. We will, you know, just like everything that we release here, um, we will actually bring this information um, up a level. Um, we'll likely see a, a version of this information on the panel UI um, and a version of this information right in the app uh, with Alarm.com and our own JCI app. So some exciting things um, to look forward to. Did you have anything to add there, Jonathan, before we uh, moved on to that or? No, you said it too good. <laughs> okay, so moving right along here. So it's funny that we talk about Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi has been around for so long that all of us think that we know, you know, everything about Wi-Fi. But unfortunately, Wi-Fi has gone through so many changes over the years and speeds are always going to be up to whatever's choking your network right so if i've got this really old printer this wi-fi printer on the network or this really old computer and this is a good way to try to talk to your wife in a new computer is that it's going to be choking down the network itself so if your isp provider can only give you let's say 300 megabyte service regardless whoever router it is is never going to give you gigabit speeds on upload it's just not possible because we can't fix that choke point but we can make the efficiency around the network be a little bit stronger, but whatever's the slowest is gonna drag the entire network down, unfortunately. So it is something to keep in mind. Yeah, so, you know, really the the, the point of this slide, um, you know, as we talk about different speeds and history of speeds is, yeah, your your system or your system speeds are only gonna be as, as good as the weakest link, right? So even though the router IQ Wi-Fi 6 is gonna be able to support up to a gig, um, you know, with with the uh, you know the hardware uh, of IQ Wi-Fi six, it, it's not a it's not a magical wizard, right? It, it it can't you know upgrade your 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 cable modem speeds if the cable modem, for example, only supports you know 50 megabits per second, um, and it's not going to make your your laptop any better if the laptop's radio or um, the way it's connected only supports you know speeds of up to you know 300 megabits per second. So you guys kind of get the get get the idea. Mesh networks are taking over the market. I, I bought my first mesh network, it was probably about four or five years ago, and I didn't even realize I bought a mesh network. And it just tells you how oblivious I was. Um, so I did buy a Euro system, um, installed it around my house to, to fix some issues. I did have some dead spots in the house. I thought, oh, this thing's supposed to fix everything. I, I bought it at Best Buy, installed it. Um, I was like, oh man, this thing is awesome. And little did I know that back then I was introducing myself to something that would literally be taking over the entire marketplace. So there's many different specs out there. There's dual bands, whether it's 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. Um, we all kind of know the difference in between 2.4. You get so much better penetration than you do with 5 gigahertz, but 5 gigahertz got that super speed that we're all wanting, right? Because we all hate seeing that dreaded buffering wheel on your device, right? When I'm trying to stream a movie or something on a device, I don't want to see the buffer wheel.
So we talk about more about mesh networks. What makes a mesh network so much better than just using a, a traditional network and maybe throwing in a range extender or, um, I just lost my train of thought there, Nate, sorry about that, buddy. But oh, we've sure. all had to do like a range extender to extend, because maybe we're trying to put in a doorbell, but we didn't test properly, right? So when we need to test for putting in a doorbell camera in someone's house, we actually need to test where the doorbell is gonna be placed and also make sure that door is closed. A lot of doors now in the residential market are now metal doors, and that will definitely cut down your signal strength there. So unfortunately, we, and almost every dealer has been burned by putting in a doorbell camera, and when they go to put it in, they realize, oh no, I don't have the right, you know, there's not enough signal strength here. Like I cannot, I can get like a picture, but I can't upload that video of, of me ringing the doorbell. It's just not there, so I'm just gonna stick in this range extender. But we have to caution ourselves with the range extender because if we're on the verge of the network or we're at a horrible signal to noise ratio, all we're doing is we're just broadcasting that horrible signal to noise ratio again. So that's why range extenders can sometimes fix the issue, but we really need to solve the problem first with a mesh network. Yeah, and I'd like to point out here too, I, I think a range extender is more or less just kind of a band-aid, right? It's not really solving the problem, you know, just to kind of add to what you're saying, Jonathan. So, you know, kind of moving uh, right along, let's talk a little bit more about mesh. So a mesh network, we can do more, more of a star or a daisy topology, you know, so earlier in the presentation, we had those three nodes around and we were making sure we were covering the entire house. So we have multiple nodes and are sharing information so we don't have those dead spots, right? Because not all of us can, can watch teenagers walk around to see where our dead spots are in our house. And maybe we haven't downloaded one of these apps to get a good understanding or maybe we're just lazy and never logged into the, to the UI, right? I'm just gonna go ahead and call myself out on that one. You know when I logged into the UI for Wi-Fi 6, it was literally yesterday when I changed my entire network around and got a lot better range because you know somebody earlier this week was making fun of me for not doing it it was me so that's when i did it and i literally could not believe how much better i made my network by just moving some nodes around and sometimes we need to move them based on the environment um there is somebody that started off this presentation that he had one of his nodes too close to his window that actually had tent on it and he just moved it a few feet and got much better service um, I moved one of my nodes downstairs from one side of the room to the other side of the room. And not only did I pick up all kinds of speed, but I also got to extend my network way out to a camera that I got on the outside of my house. So it was a double fold for me just by using some of these tools. Do you have anything more to add to there, Nate? No, well, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about mesh networks. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think I think the only other thing that I would add, and we've kind of already alluded to it in our previous uh, webinar on IQ Wi-Fi 6 and, you know, setup, um, is the fact that these also can support a hardwired uh, backhaul. So, you know, in the event that you have that um, distance that you have to span, you know, say it's just right on the fringe and the wireless uh, connectivity um, is not going to work you know maybe it's a detached uh, garage or that mother-in-law apartment or maybe the pool house as long as you've got copper copper you know connecting the two buildings together uh, you could uh, you know connect these things together uh, via the, the ethernet cable the land to land uh, connection as well so you know in, instead of just uh, putting a band-aid on it using uh, you know a, a network extender you're actually uh, improving the, the the network by adding, you know, one of these mesh uh, capable uh, devices. So um, it is a pretty exciting uh, a solution. I'm 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 super uh, glad that we've decided to um, get into networking. I I know that our customers have been asking for it for quite some time, and um, you know, with the added benefit with uh, you know the back end support with Alarm.com. Um, you know, I, I, I really see that this is uh, going to uh, be a good solution for a lot of our customers. So with that, um, I, I guess I'll ask Neil and uh, Joel, I'm, I'm sure they're frantically answering questions in the background. Is there any other uh, questions that have come up, Neil or uh, Joel, that um, you guys might want to um, yeah, bring up? There, yeah, I mean, actually, we, we've got the majority answered. 
<laughs> so it's great. Um, there's a few questions asking, uh, you know, IQ Wi-Fi didn't. Does IQ Wi-Fi 6 have the ability for MAC reservation? Or IP reservation. Or IP reservation. Yeah, those are those are great questions. A um, lot, lot of good reasons why you might want to do that. Maybe you've got a IQ Wi-Fi, or excuse me, an IQ uh, four or IQ two that you're integrating with a Control Four system. Right? Um, great reason to use MAC IP reservation. Um, and yes, you you do have the capability of doing that um, right in the web UI. Awesome. Um, Don asked, what is the maximum number of addresses available on Wi-Fi 6, like wired or wireless? What's the ma maximum number of uh, IP addresses? Um, so, you know, it's just like any other network. Um, I think the DHCP range is set to or limited right around 100 addresses, but you could open that up to up to 255 or 254, you know, minus the, uh, the gateway. <laughs> And then, Paul, uh, we got one more question. I'm going to let everybody uh, you know, go for the day and hope everybody has a good long weekend. Uh, with being mesh, how do you tell which agent a device is connected to? Ooh, good one. That is a good one. Um, yeah, so built right into the panel. If, if you've got the, the IQ panel um, connected to IQ Wi-Fi, um, we have the capability of seeing um, all that information, all the connected devices. Um, you know, I don't have my, my panel actually set up with Pfizer, otherwise I'd uh, switch over to it here real quick and, and show you what that looks like. But um, you can actually go in and create profiles and um, there's a way to even go in and, and, and manage, you know, each individual device based on profiles. And um, we have a, a, a way to even update the icon. Um, yeah, so there's lots of connectivity options and, and uh, control and, and visibility that you, that, that you have right there on the panel. Yeah, I mean, and you can see it through the web UI too, right? So on the web UI, you can see exactly what, uh, what you know, as long as you know the MAC address of your device, you can see exactly which agent it's actually connected to. So it's great. Okay, hey so perfect question here. When are, the, when are these available? Ooh, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. We, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping, um, we are actually in regression testing with Alarm.com right now. Um, yeah, I'd give it about uh, two and a half, three weeks. Um, so we're we're about a half a week, almost a full week in regression. So it's uh, yeah, we're just chomping at the bit to, to 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 start shipping. We are chomping at the bit. All right, so great job, guys. As always, uh, we'll have you know uh, as this webinar ends, there will be just a quick after workshop survey to get some feedback and what you would like to see on future webinars. Uh, we hope everybody has an awesome long weekend. It's a you know for once it's a long weekend in Canada and in the U.S. <laughs> so uh, it's not normally me, you know, one of us being off. We're all off on Monday. So hope everybody has a good weekend. Uh, Adrian and I will see you next Thursday uh, as we talk about the uh, Alarm.com uh, integration. And take care and thanks for t thanks for coming as always. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us. Bye.